So this is um, in the same way that, say, C.K. Prahalad wrote about entirely new markets in uh, fast-moving consumer goods. Are you, are you suggesting that, that there's actually entirely new markets for technology-enabled services, for example, in, in not just new geographic markets, but types of service as well? I, I think so. So I had extensive discussions with C.K. Prahalad on this, and therefore I must give him credit for molding my thinking on this. So this is the first time I met Gary Hamill and C.K. Prahalad in MLab right, in the moonshots in San Francisco. And the first time I presented, and that's the only reason I got confidence to go out and write a book. Otherwise, I, I did not even have confidence and anybody wants to read it. So when Gary and CK talk, you know, first heard about this concept, they said, yes, this is like the bottom of the pyramid, but what you have done is you have converted the bottom of the pyramid value in a completely disruptive style because you've unleashed it, unlocked it, right? And therefore, the, the, idea, the idea from that point of view is unique, not unique is the wrong word, is, is very compelling. Now, would it create a new opportunity of service offering, especially on the cloud? I, the, the obvious answer is yes. I think there is going to be a new industry, if, if you truly believe, and more people want to walk down this path. And I just made a presentation to 15,000 uh, HR executives in San Diego, and the, their response indicated to me that they love the idea and more people hence want to adopt and experiment with this idea in their in their custom, in their premises i think the time has come for a completely new industry to be created around this to electronically enable this from happening so how would you define the difference then between an organization that focuses on employees first and enabling employees and uh, the cooperative movement, uh, say a company like John Lewis in the UK that, that ensures uh, people are not employees but they're, they're partners in the firm, no matter where they sit in the organization. I think if you, so, you know, I, I wrote an article and they asked me who's your favorite CEO and I had said Mohammed Yunus, right, of Grameen Bank. I think, you know, my, my best CEO are religious leaders who somehow get you every Sunday in the church you pay to go there in time and money. You feel extremely good about it. You want to belong there. And you feel the most happiest going there, right? Whether it is kirtans in India, mosques in some other places, or churches in some, some other places, you do that. And then you move to the Grameen Bank kind of examples, which are communities, right? When people collaborate and create intrinsic value for the organization and share it, and the amount of enthusiasm and the business value which is unlocked is huge. And then you come to Employee First organization, right? So I, I truly believe that Employee First is inferior to those models. And they those models are creating much higher value than the Employee First model. And therefore, my next experiment is how can I take this business model and drive it towards that as much as possible? I don't know what is the possibility there, but you're absolutely right. And then the fourth model is the command and control model, right? So we, we are in four quadrants where these two guys are way ahead uh, compared to these two business models. Um, and, and I mean, it seems at odds though, because once a company goes public, then there's, there's always this quarterly emphasis on the numbers. <laughs> So how, how do you get, get the analysts to look at the long-term future of the company? I, I think we have four stakeholders in life, right? The employees, the customers, the society, and the analyst. A analyst means the shareholders. And I think the shareholders today have a stranglehold uh, you know, on what the company does. Therefore, especially in US and Europe, the CEOs have shorter tenures, and they're expected to deliver results in the short terms, and therefore, I would, I would shudder to think how they will implement a, you know, a strategy which is a longer term implication for the good of the company. I think that is changing now. I think the recession has taught that the over dependence on growth, short term objectives is not going to work and therefore the, the shareholders are also becoming smarter and saying what is your long term strategy, what are you, where are you investing. They are demonstrating a bit more patience and I think so that is happening. However, if you truly are a large shareholder of an organization, you know, and truly believe in long term, quote unquote, not say, but believe in long term, then you will put the board structure in the fashion that they are thinking long term issues, like the one which I'm talking about, rather than short term issues. And I think that will come, that maturity, in the because there is enough regulation which is coming around, it is enough learning in the markets which we have during recession, 
And I think long and enough crisis we have created for ourselves, whether it is British Airway crisis or whether it is Air India crisis or we have enough crisis around us and enough learning around this that if we don't handle this interface between employees and customers well, today it is around unions, but tomorrow it is disgruntled employees. Mm. Uh, if we don't handle it well, we don't we we don't have a choice. And I think that that movement will slowly happen. So, so would you think that I mean, if you were running an airline, for example, uh, I mean, not any specific airline, but but suppose you you were struggling with union problems, uh, the ash cloud across Europe, um, totally disrupting service, w would it be that interface between the employee and the public that that keeps your your airline solvent, basically? So first is I was in Ashcloud, I was stuck in exactly this room in this hotel, right? And I've gone through the experience of how different airlines were communicating, were responding, and how, you know, I, I, ha I have a personal <laughs> anecdotal experience to see, and therefore I've made up my mind as to which airlines I'm going to travel and, you know, not travel with. But I think today we are in this position in a lot of airlines, right, where the trust between the employees and the unions, right, not unions, employees and the management has been disrupted because of which both have taken what I call positions which are based on mistrust. Now the management has a point of view, right? And maybe the employees have a point of view. Now unions in, are in between. So, you know, I, I don't understand unions. Therefore, I can't comment on the role unions have to play. So I just want to interplay this employees and, and customers. And, all I, I can say is wherever people desperately want freedom, they've got it. Wherever people desperately want democracy, they've got it. So wherever employees desperately trust in management and want to believe in management and want to grow the company, I think they will get it. Mm. So the question is who breaks the ice? How does it happen? I don't know. I, I'm not an expert in that area. But I just believe that all these are indicators that if over a period of time you create mistrust, then you, you take a position which is very difficult to unlock. And that is the problem today. The position, people take positions. Air India is the same position. We've taken, now positions are being taken which are going to be very difficult to unlock. And I suppose one of the, uh, the, the, the things about this philosophy in general is that, that it's almost, um, it, it's pushing power downwards. It, it, it's empowering people. Um, but, but historically, Indian management culture has been quite hierarchical and, and with working within a defined hierarchy. I mean, the Indian civil service is a good example. So, so do you think that this transcends uh, national cultures? So, uh, very interesting. British Petroleum is not an Indian company, and you can see the, the culture in that company. And I've actually written a blog on it, which, which is another point which I want to make, is that it is not just about the management and the people. It is the recognition in media and it is the recognition of all that the, the British Petroleum employees who are going to solve our crisis are the people we're taking to task. So today we should be motivating them. It doesn't matter who created the crisis, right? They are the people who will solve us. So instead of motivating and supporting them, today we are criticizing them. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of how society looks at employees, mm -hmm. distinct from management and distinct from shareholders. So we have to make that distinction so that we are in the business of enthusing, enabling, and encouraging the British Petroleum employees so that they don't feel like shit after working for 24 hours, coming home and somebody saying, you're British Petroleum employee. So that's that's first part of it. Let's go to the, this whole concept of Indian. <clears throat> if you see Manmohan Singh, right, the experiment he did on employee first, I would believe, was he, he launched this you know, Right to Information Act. Right to Information Act <clears throat> is that any citizen can file a file the application to get any information from the bureaucracy. The moment he did that, one single catalyst action, that means all information in the files of government, other than national secret, are available in the hands of employee. And he fought tooth and nail on, on you know, this whole transparency and what will it do. Suddenly the bureaucracy has become more accountable. This is the point I was making. That actually, even in an environment like India, where the bureaucracy is very strong and hierarchies are very important, one small action has created a catalyst of making the people more important than the bureaucracy. And therefore, it, whether it is India or US or Europe, it doesn't matter. It just takes small action. And he is very popular because of that. Yeah. He suddenly has handed over the power in the hands of the, uh, hands of the people. And if he had done anything to dismantle the bureaucracy, he would have failed. But one thing made a huge amount of difference.